Good morning, church. Hope you're doing great today. Uh, good morning. And it's Tuesday, July 21st. And if you're like me, you've probably been up for already uh, a bunch of hours, but uh, it's been a great time in the Word, and we are in Zephaniah. And remember that word uh, to Zephaniah, what his name means, actually. It means the Lord protects or the Lord hides. Um, I was reading something really interesting, and that was uh, one commentator uh, thought that maybe um, our looks to the dates of when Zephaniah was born and uh, during maybe the reign of, and it kind of goes to the reign of Manasseh. And Manasseh wasn't a great king. And remember what I mentioned before, and that is with Zephaniah, uh, he was kind of part of the uh, aristocracy of the day. The the high and the fluent, the powerful, those who were superior in the uh, uh, area of Jerusalem. And uh, he was from a royal blood, too. And uh, so this guy was on the inside, if you will. And uh, and Manasseh wasn't a great king when he was born. And he had a he, he I'm sure saw a bunch of things that um, went against God's law. And so we're in verse 4 today, and we're just going to read it, and we're going to go down to verse 6 and just spend a little time there, and uh, hope it's just a wonderful time for you. It says, Here I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place, the names of the idolatrous priest with the pagan priests, those who worship the host of heaven on the housetops, those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, but who also swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. I tell you what, I really thank the Lord for Jesus. And, and it's sometimes when reading the prophets, uh, I, I tend to be thankful even most. And I think it's because when you read the prophets and you read about God, uh, God's hand, uh, and I like how it says this, I will stretch out my hand. When you read about that stretching out of the hand of God in the Bible, it always usually, or it usually is a reference to Something to do with stretching out the hand of God to judge. Um, uh, some kind of divine work of God through a person. Uh, Moses, stretch out your hand kind of thing. And uh, But a lot of times it, it can be used of the Lord stretching out his hand in judgment. And 50 times it's used in the Bible. You can check out Exodus chapter 3, verse 20, Moses kind of stuff, and uh, see that, that word being used. I will stretch out my hand. I guess my point is, is that when you hear about the Lord stretching out his hand, man, you got to wake up. And, you know, one of the things that God's prophets always pointed out is the failure that we have as human beings. And they and you you would think that the Bible might have like a certain group that's pious, you know, a certain city that's pious and good and doing well, like Jerusalem, for instance. Hey, it's got to be doing great. But no, even Jerusalem, the holy city, the righteous city, is uh, stumbling. And remember, we saw that also as well in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, right? Jerusalem again was judged even in the latter days there was a giant earthquake and it says i think a tenth of the city fell died and so god is in the business of stretching out his hand and he is in the business of judging sin god wouldn't be god if he didn't judge sin so i can't get too mad at him um because if a judge didn't uphold the law, then that judge wouldn't be really a righteous judge, would they? Um, and we get bummed when injustice happens in the world all the time. 
So if we get bummed at injustice that goes on in the world, then we must be able to look clearly that if there's an injustice with God, is not God right and just to judge his creation? And why would we get mad at God for doing such a thing as stretching out his hand? Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, we have people from India, and uh, we hope you guys are doing great overseas. So it says, not only will he stretch out my hand against Judah, but also against the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So judgment will begin in the house of the Lord. 1 Peter 4.17, uh, we get that. So we're not shocked when God judges his own people. Now, I want to read to you a passage uh, from 2 Kings during when Zephaniah was probably a young lad and maybe even born around this time when Manasseh reigned. And it says that the people paid no attention to the law of God in 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 9. And it says, And Manasseh seduced the people to do more evil in the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. So he did more evil than the nations. Um, then it says, The Lord spoke by his servants the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations, he had acted more wickedly than all the Amorites who were before him, and also made Judah sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. Really interesting, right? People will be shocked that God would judge his own people like this. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. Whoa! Really radical, right? Absolutely intense. But we shouldn't be shocked by this either, because those of us that know our New Testament, we've read the book of Revelation. We just went through it together. And we remember that in Revelation chapter 11, that city of Jerusalem that was called, it says in the book of Revelation, Sodom and Egypt. So Jerusalem will have its struggles once again, and the idea of idolatry will will um, be a problem once again. It might not look like uh, the idols of the old days, but it will still be the same. It's, um, and uh, it says, I will cut off in, in verse 4 every trace of Baal from this place. I talked about cutting off last time. But that word is used, cut off, 419 times. Cut off is used that many times in your Bible. Wow. 419 times. There's a lot of cutting off going on on in the Bible. And this has got to be something that we pay attention to, that this is what God is about. And as we spoke, as I talked about last uh, yesterday, uh, God is about cutting off uh, idols from our lives. And so uh, God will cut off every trace of Baal from this place. The names of the idolatrous priest with the pagan priest. And I like that word names. Um, I always like to underline it because in our study of Revelation, we saw that names played a big part as well. It was used 28 times and uh, in the book of Revelation itself. So names is a huge topic within the book of Revelation. And it means, you know, it talks about familiarity, um, being close to, being associated with, um, bearing the name, having the name, having your identity with. The names of the idolatrous priest with the pagan priest, they were familiar to the people of Israel. They became well acquainted with them. The names of the idolatrous priest were attached to Israel 
at this time. And, you know, that's that always is a convicting thing for us, too, right? That is there things that are attached to us? Um, is there a false God that is attached to us? Um, do we associate um, in our life? Do we represent? Um, are we close to uh, false deities? Now, the reason why I brought up at the beginning is that the prophets are always super convicting is because they show our utter failure. This is why you need Christ. When you read the prophets, you, I don't think you ever should read the prophets thinking like you actually can do everything that they failed in. Um, you probably need to read the prophets by going, Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Help me, Lord. To trust in you and to 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 look to Yahshua Jesus as our Savior and it so it should it should move us into seeing our failures and so it says the names of the idolatrous priest with the pagan priest those who worship the host of heaven on the housetops those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, but who also swear by Molech, right? Milcom. Those who have turned uh, back from following the Lord and have sought the Lord, have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. So a couple things I see here and that one of them is that, um, you know, Israel is always looked at as Kind of one of the ways uh, uh, that Israel is looked at is as a bride, and as a wife, you know, as a bride, as a wife of of actually a wife of of God. It's it, Israel spoken of as as being the wife. Um, you know, it would be harlotry to go to another god um, because harlotry carries the idea that someone is married, but yet they are. They're going away from the marital covenant into a different relationship. And, it, you know, so for us, it's, uh, you know, we see that, um, I think personally, the idea I get from my own life is that, you know, come back to your first love. What is my first love? What, you know, and that's Christ, you know. And, you know, don't move away from, from you know, inquiring and seeking the Lord and we're going to see that admonishment here that Zephaniah gives the people um, in the book of Revelation we saw once again that the harlot there was a harlot in the book of Revelation and that harlot had blasphemous names and it's interesting that the book of Revelation uses the word harlot because the word harlot kind of really goes back to these passages that we read in the Old Testament about Israel here, it says worshiping these other deities, playing the harlot. Now the reason why I find this so fascinating is John in the book of Revelation chapter 17, when he sees the woman riding the beast, the harlot riding the beast, he's like blown away. It says he's amazed by what he saw. And then, then there is an interpretation for him that's given to help him understand and this woman is 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 something that really entices him in the sense of it amazes him it make it, it just reels him in it puts him right into thinking like wow what it captivates him you know uh, to see this and you know, and it, and God always speaks of Israel of how amazed it is that Israel not just uh, um, is moving away from Yahweh, but but literally goes totally into harlotry and sells. He the the word that's used is the the idea that Israel sells themselves to other deities. And I think of our lives, man, I don't want to sell myself to other things, right? And that's what I always have to watch out for. And I find in my heart that there's a heart that wants to just give in and just go those directions. 
and and just kind of lose yourself to something. And that's what Israel did. They just lost themselves to other things. And so I got to be careful not to lose myself into other things. At times, those things are in our lives. We've given ourselves over to something. And some people say, well, that's not me. I've never given myself over to something. Oh, yeah? Greed? You've never given yourself over to greed? How about selfishness? Have you ever given yourself over to your selfishness? How about anger? Have you ever given yourself over to anger? Where you've liked it and you've chosen it, where you've gone in those directions. We all have gone in these ways where we've given ourselves over to things, right? Instead of seeking Yahweh, as it says here, we have gone another way. So Israel, the wife of Christ, or the wife of, yeah, Yahweh, and churches, the church is called the bride of Christ, by the way. But in, in the Old Testament, Israel is seen as the wife of Yahweh. And here, the wife goes to another, right? Commits harlotry and goes to the other. Now, there, in verse 6, I just want to touch on something because I think it's really cool. Those who have turned back from following the Lord. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 39, there's a great admonishment to us. And I'll read it to you here. It says, but we are not of those who draw back. Isn't that good? We're not of those who turn back um, to destruction, right? But we are of those who believe to the saving of the soul. What a great passage, right? What a great encouragement. You know, we are of those who don't draw back. We are of those who continue to move forward. Get back up, right? Always get back up and and get back into the game. It says, we have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. And that means consult. To, cons- to inquire means to consult, to to specifically seek with a purpose, right? And so we see this seeking, consulting quite a bit in the Bible. You might recognize Jesus says, seek and you shall find. When was the last time that you just took some time to consult the Lord, to seek the Lord? Now, when we talk about inquiring of him, we, we are talking about consulting his word. What does his word say about that? And then we look to it and we get into the word to find out what the word would have to say about that issue. We always look at the context, the historical context, right? The who, what, where, when, why, right? So we can discern what God's word is to us but we want to consult and inquire of the Lord when was the last time maybe you have done that in your life where you needed to really just sit down and seek the Lord and consult the Lord inquire of him really have a purpose um, an intentional purpose in inquiring of him I know sometimes like you can be overwhelmed by your sin and then you just, you know, you come back to the word and you you inquire of the Lord and the Lord shows you passages that are so crystal clear and you go, wow, thank you, Lord, for just reminding me of those things and showing me. Well, that's the inquiring of God and then and then moving forward after we seek him and inquire of him. So there's some great things there, right, in this little section. And a lot of stuff to kind of ponder for us as well. So I hope you guys got some good stuff out of this little section of Zephaniah. There's, again, a lot of references we can go to in the book of Revelation for this. And we see that just as in Zephaniah's day, Israel, specifically Jerusalem, would be a focal point of God's judgment and cleansing um, to make her holy. So we see in the book of Revelation the same thing going on. So much so is Jerusalem the focus that the 
the bride at the very latter part of the book of Revelation is called what? The New Jerusalem. Yeah, pretty radical, right? So cutting off all the idols, all the traces of false deities, cleansing her, making her holy, right? These kind of ideas. So um, God is a righteous judge, and we see in the Bible um, his hand being stretching out against sin. And we see that God is righteous because he is a judge, a righteous judge. Uh, and um, we should never be bummed that uh, God is a judge. I would be more scared if God didn't judge Um, Because then what does that say about God, right? That says God doesn't care so much about sin at all. And and what if you as a parent didn't care about sin? What if what if none of us cared about it? You know, people can murder and we would just be like, hey, that's okay." And we're living in a day that's very interesting where Zephaniah is going to talk about this this day that we live in where people are afraid to just say what what is right and what is wrong and people are confused and I was kind of interesting I was my uh, bro sent me a a little clip on YouTube of this guy who goes to the universities and he's at like a big giant institution you know university and he goes up to people and he says hey um, you know, what if I want to be a Chinese person? What do you think of that? And he, then he gives them the mic, you know, and they're, you could see the students like kind of uh, like they don't want to say, uh, well, you're not. They don't want to say, oh, well, man, you're not Chinese. Instead, they just kind of go, well, you know, that's fine. And he just keeps this guy, this the guy who's doing the interview just keeps pushing the envelope of like, well, what if I want to be this? Or what if I say this is true? What do you say to that? And you could see where people were just going like, uh, I don't know. And what happens is when we don't, when we don't uh, understand, when we throw out justice, what is good and what is bad, then all bets are off. You can't say anything to anybody. Um, you couldn't make any judgment at that. So I thank God God's a, a, ju- a, a judge and he's depicted in Zephaniah as a righteous judge. So that's just one of the ways he's seen here um and we will see more as we get into the book so anyway you guys have a great day okay uh take care and we'll talk to you soon bye-bye